Okay. But yeah, there we go. All right, it's 2.01 Eastern here. Good afternoon and good morning to everybody. We're going to get going with this trade pending webinar, 10 dealerships that are amazing at inventory sourcing because they're smart and they know that new inventory really isn't coming for uh, quite some time here or really who knows when. Let's make sure I can work my controls too. It's me, Matthew, Chief Marketing Officer at Trade Pending. Matt Lasher is here with us from West Her. Hey, Matt. Hey. Thanks for joining us. We're going you don't to look like your picture. You know, there's this something different, and it's probably time to get a new headshot going on. But you actually look remarkably similar. Yeah, I'm the same. <laughs> All right, here we go. We're going to record this. We'll share it on afterwards. And if you have questions, use the Q&A, and we'll take them as we go. Definitely, as we're speaking with Matt more in depth, we'll, we'll uh, fold those in and we'll take whatever we've got left at the end. If we don't answer it, well, I'll shoot you a note. All right. So this is a top performing webinar. How do we define top performer? Well, we took a pretty kind of broad but narrow approach here. We're just saying it's websites with over 100,000 visitors per month, and they've got really, really good conversion rates off of those visitors. From, so from a website visitor to a trade-in lead, north of 1%. We do have to be fair. We know that not everybody's in larger markets or has lots of sites that they can pull from, but they also do really well with conversions. Good job. Um, and we, we also know that uh, certainly it, it's never about the tool that you use. That's a piece of it, but more important is what you do with it. So advertising effort, budgets, that can all play a difference in terms of who does really well with this stuff. So with that being said, let's jump in. The first site we're gonna take a look at here we're going to go in depth on this one a little bit and a little bit with, with Matt. Uh, we'll actually go into a lot of depth with Matt and then we'll speed things up here. So we get it done here in close to half an hour with Grand Prairie Ford. What we like about this, look at the spinning wobbly bird head there. I hope you like that, man. Uh, right. So we're, we're calling out here that they're doing a really good job calling out saying, yes, Hey, we need your car. They're putting this as a banner atop of mobile on top of desktop They've got the value your trade button down here. They've got this big banner, like we want to buy your vehicle. They are taking this seriously. They've got their placement above the fold here. You're probably saying to yourself now, wow, surprising trade pending who makes a trade in tool wants you to put this stuff everywhere, like go figure. Well, fortunately we have some data to help support why this is important. This is a survey we run every year. If you've been on one of our webinars, you've seen this before. The data has been the same for seven years in a row. The number one reason people come to a dealership's website to look at, look at cars. Number two, they're there to value your trade in. So that's why you really wanna make this stuff as present and visible in as many places as you can. So jumping back in here, they are also doing a great job of not only having links to value your trade in finance, but also across new and used. There we go. They replicate all these fundamental uh, best practices across their SRP and VDP. Man, we're just using all sorts of great PowerPoint animation today here. Stuff's flying in left and right. You can see, again, they're reinforcing this message up here with this banner. They're doing it on mobile. They are doing it here with the value your trade button here on the VDP as well. And then really importantly here is they're not just set it, forget it. They're playing an active role here. And so you can see here, they're running campaigns on Facebook to talk about buying your car. I'm calling out here their URL. Normally this is really geeky, boring marketing stuff, but they're using Google's URL builder to create these tracking codes so they can actually see which campaigns are working best, spend more money in the ones that are working, cut it from those that don't. I have the little monocle emoji guy here for the the chin scratching thing here because they, they're doing a great job. They have this will buy your car. They have this separate page here, but they're not working people through the normal trade-in process there through, uh, you know, value your trade. It's a, it's a submit a form. So that's one area I'd say like, hey, let's look at that. But they're also taking advantage of Google My Business. They're putting up posts there talking about valuing your trade, selling their car and looking at the data. They're doing email marketing. They're doing AdWords. So they're running kind of the full approach here. So good job to you guys. And Bonus points, they have a separate standalone site for their Spanish speaking audience here. So they're obviously they're in a big Spanish speaking area and they are capturing this market. They're doing a great job of it. Kudos. Are they on the call right now, Matt? I don't think so. I don't know. No. Okay. But now it's time to talk to Matt. Hello, Matt. Hello again. What's up? <laughs> All right. So we're going to walk through a couple of fundamentals. We see you guys doing well, and then we'll jump into the Q&A. 
So we do love seeing you guys have the same strong fundamentals in place across uh, homepage, SRP, VDP, well done to that. We also really like the fact that you guys have this value your trade here and your call to action stack. That's just another great area to capture attention. Somebody's find the car they're looking at and boom, right there. That's, I got to think about my trade in, here we go. Actively running campaigns, all the best practices you'd expect to see. And then two last things here to call out. Love the fact that you guys are using DS conversations here. That's powered by the trade pending API. So if somebody comes to your site one week and uses our trade in tool and they get one value, they come back next week and go through here, they're going to see consistent values. So they're not confused as to why one value is this and the other one's that. That's no good. And you guys have also done a great job of being smart about how you route your leads out to your various dealers so that um, they're your your consumers there are just getting faster and more timely follow-up all right so, so funny story matt i'll share with you the inside scoop here uh dealer inspire is the reason i know about trade pending back in 2017 it existed as a website integration and i saw it in some demo of a di site and i said what's that mobile mobile friendly whatever and so i called up trade pending i'm like I, and i don't usually call vendors for things but um and then i i said well i've I want, I want trade pending on our site. So that's, that's, that was the, uh, that's how the relationship started. It was, so DI gets all the credit. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. All right. So we're going to start with, I hope is a softball question. How did you end up in automotive and what makes West her a good place to be? Yeah. And so look, uh, I've been in auto my whole professional career, basically. So I started at Nissan North America. I did five years of random sales and marketing jobs out of college. Uh, 1-800-NISSAN was like my cut my teeth with customer customers, consumer affairs. Um, I looked around at corporate Nissan North America in Los Angeles, and I didn't really want to be any of my bosses. So I quit with about uh, 10,000 bucks to my name to sell t-shirts out of the trunk of my car. And I played poker for two years uh, to pay my bills. Um, primarily online, but also in LA and Las Vegas. And then I wanted to get married, have kids, do all of that stuff. So I moved from San Francisco to Buffalo, where I grew up, had an opportunity to sell cars, sold cars, was a finance manager during Cash for Clunkers, was a used car manager for a couple of years. And I've been doing this marketing role at West Her now for almost 10. Wonderful. And what what's, makes West Her a great place to be? Um, you know, look, I think we do, we try to do things the right way. When we screw up, we say, we're sorry. Uh, there's no manipulation, right? Like honesty and integrity are core elements of our business. Um, our leadership is humble and servants, uh, driven to make an impact in the community. We try to be family friendly and oriented in terms of like, you got that baseball game you got to go to, or you got a doctor's appointment or a thing you got to get to, like, it's not a big deal. You can go do that. Um, and then obviously the power and strength of Wester having 30 locations in Buffalo and Rochester helps. So if you're a salesperson, you can sell any of the used cars we have. We have 3,500 used cars now, um, and we represent over uh, 20 something OEMs now. So, um, you know, you have a great opportunity to help customers if you're on the sales side of things. So uh, there's a lot of positives, a lot of good reasons, um, but those are a few. Tell us about your big picture approach to marketing and then drill that down into how you're thinking about inventory sourcing today. So uh, at West Her, I think of you marketing, we're, we're responsible for the brand. We're the chief stewards of the brand, our marketing team. Uh, it's a company that's been in business for 70 years. So it's not a brand that I'm inventing. It's not a brand that um, I'm really crafting, so to speak. Um, but I view my job is to keep, keep our company um, in the eyes of the consumer, a human oriented brand. We're a privately held, locally owned company. And I want to tell the stories of our employees and, uh, and, and our customers. So uh, to humanize our brand wherever possible, social media is a great way to do that, um, is, is really what we're after. But we pride ourselves on our team. Uh, we're sort of an employee first company. Um, you know, we believe in empowering our employees uh, to do the right thing, right? And so a happy, a happy employee will service the customer the right way. Um, so I, I think at a, at a macro, um, you know, I'm just trying to keep Wester human. Uh, we sell 40% of the new vehicle brands we represent in Western New York. So we, have, we operate at a really, really high density that's unusual in a market. So I think there is risk of us being like the big bad wolf or like, you know, the big corporation or there's risk of us losing our soul a little bit. Um, but Scott Beeler, our president and CEO, is super engaged in the community and super active in the business. And we're donating stuff all the time. Just this week, 
Um, I donated a crew boat, $49,000 to a group of eight women or 20 women that have survived breast cancer. Um, and then two days later, we donated a wheelchair accessible van, 30,000 bucks to a music, music teacher uh, who is confined to a wheelchair. So, you know, we're always doing things like that all the time. So, um, and then I think where I started was just, you know, own our mistakes. So when we screw up, we say we're sorry and we try to make you better than even uh, as a general uh, philosophy. So then break that down for us more into just how you're thinking about inventory sourcing today and, and marketing for that. So inventory sourcing, we know the best source of uh, inventory is our customers and at the curb. Um, we do have a independent buying pool. Uh, we have an independent, we have our own auction where we uh, wholesale vehicles with more than 110,000 miles on them or cars that we deem not retailable. Um, but we, and we have a buying team that does buy cars at auctions um, around the country. Um, and, uh, and, but I would say customer acquisition is our number one focus as well as uh, lease turn in pipeline, right? So being a new car franchise dealer, uh, the lease turn in pipeline is a really a, attractive source of inventory. Say, so. Sure. How do you approach the, your group marketing and advertising versus your individual rooftops in terms of campaigns and brand awareness? How do you juggle that? Yeah, well, we're lucky that we're pretty centralized, right? I mentioned all of our stores are within about 100 miles of each other. 27 of the 30 are within like 45 miles, all in Buffalo. So, so that helps. Um, we operate relatively centralized in terms of marketing message and marketing decision. It kind of comes through me in the office here. But, but that's worked uh, in healthy collaboration, I'll say, with each store. So every store, every brand, as we know, have co-op guidelines and other things that they have to, uh, ways they need to go to market or operate with. And so we try to be good corporate partners. So if Ford or Chevy or Kia or whoever wants us to do something or try something, we try to support that. Um, but we have our corporate initiatives and big uh, overall branding things that we try to push as well. Got it. How do you guys think about handling leads, right? So everything from routing to creating a sense of urgency to that sales process. Yeah, for sure. So we do have a centralized BDC. Um, during COVID, we sort of evolved and it, uh, the team is allowed to work remote uh, if they're established. New hired B BDC members um, do have to work at a store and sort of establish themselves physically first, uh, but they can earn the privilege to work remote. Um, and so traditional lead routing, most internet leads do go through our BDC department first. So they're trying to connect to the customer with really the ultimate goal of making an appointment for our sales and management team. Um, I will say this is a trade pending conversation. So, I, so if we just talk about lead routing or lead handling for trade pending for a second, we do try to create a little greater sense of urgency um, of our trade pending leads. So the way we've done that is we have early manager involvement for these types of leads. So depending on the store, it's a little bit different depending on how each store wants to operate, whether it's a general manager or a used car manager or somebody uh, that wants to sort of run point on these particular types of leads. But these managers will often reach out to the customers first um, before the BDC even has a chance to do it because they recognize the value in acquiring trades, right? And so they want to just have that conversation real time. These are people that are buying cars through lanes or at the curb or appraising customer cars every day. So they can have a different type of conversation than the BDC. Got it. I'm going to hit you with another tactical question, then bring it back up big picture. And reminder, if anyone listening in here today has questions for Matt, use the Q&A to type them in and we'll take them here in just a second. All right. So my next tactical question is, so what's new, what's different, what's changed about just the types of campaigns that you're running um, reach, frequency, messaging around inventory sourcing. So um, are we going to talk about the campaigns that we, we, we talked about before later, or should I talk about that here? Go fire away. So, uh, so we've been using trade pending since like 2017, right? We do these biannual sales uh, that we're proud of and we kind of hang our hat on that you can see pretty, pretty clear measured results in the uh, analytic, the trade pending analytics. Um, it's a $50 million trade-in sales event. What this is based on is typically we carry about 2,000 cars in stock. We have 3,500 to 4,000 now, but at 2,000 cars, that's an approximate value of $50 million inventory. We turn our inventory approximately once a month. So the marketing puffery here is we are spending $50 million on trade-ins. It's 
factually accurate because it's based on the size of our inventory and they're turning uh, inventory once a month. But it gives this uh, perception or allure to customers that we have $50 million available for them in their forerunner that they want to trade in or whatever. So we do that twice a year. Uh, spring, usually it's like, you know, March, April, May kind of time frame, and then fall, which is like, you know, October, November time frame. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, maybe a Nordstrom sale or whatever. But what we like about it is that messaging is different than what any other dealership group, especially in our area, can even say. They can't even say that with credibility, right? Because we have far more inventory than our competitors in Western New York. So we can kind of leverage that as an opportunity to sort of highlight how that could be a consumer benefit for them. Um, so we see these measured spikes every time we do these sales events where it really, uh, but we're advertising across traditional mechanisms. We also do advertise on social and digital platforms. Um, we do that all, the, all year round, the social and digital stuff all year round, but during the sales event, we might do it a little bit heavier. Um, but yeah, that, so, so that's one sort of interesting takeaway. So you, so anybody on the call, like if you're listening, you can add up the inventory cost of your, of your dealership. Most inventory sizes are 1 million to 2 million, something like that. If you got 50 to hundred used cars on your lot. So I don't know how big the groups are or whatever, whoever's listening, but, um, so you could, you could do, you could copy that. Say we're having a $2 million trade-in sales event this month, uh, here at, you know, Matthews trade pending Ford store or whatever. That's a, that's a good store. Good store. Okay. Um, so yeah. And I, so I don't know if I answered your question on like reach frequency messaging. Um, we look at those things a little differently depending on the medium, um, you know, our reach and frequency targets for like TV, for example, we try to reach 50% um, or more of the active audience three or more times a month. That's how we kind of measure TV. But on Facebook, you can get frequency numbers that are really, really high, like seven to 10 to 15 times. Um, I think you can compete with yourself a little bit uh, through like the Facebook platform um, and really drive up costs on yourself by trying to spend too much money too fast. But um, uh, and then with respect to messaging, we do do independent campaigns, just kind of like you saw in the best practices with the uh, that Ford store before before me. Um, where, you know, sell us your car or paying top dollar for your car. We have sandwich boards outside of our dealerships that say we pay cash for cars, right? Like, so at every opportunity, we are talking about the fact that we want to buy your car. We do service lane exercises. So real in-store stuff where we're talking to customers about their opportunity to upgrade their vehicle or just straight away sell us, sell us their car. Wonderful. All right. We're getting some questions coming in. We're going to take them in just a second. My big picture question here is, you know, a lot of what you've described in our conversation sounds a lot like consumer lifetime value, but that's not a phrase you typically hear in automotive very much today. Are you guys actively thinking about the lifetime value of your customers and how? Yeah, well, we don't measure it in that regard. Uh, admittedly, we have some weaknesses with respect to all these disparate databases that we work with. You know, there's six or seven databases in total. So to have an accurate picture of what the actual lifetime value is of a customer, um, we're not that measured. But I will tell you philosophically, Scott Beeler cares a great deal about repeat and referral business. 15% of our advertising budget goes to like a referral fund where we pay $100 for a referral to our company. Um, so about 15% of the transactions every month um, we pay out a referral fee. Um, the, that system gets gamed a little bit, but our philosophy there is we're giving a hundred bucks to somebody in the consumer and in, in, in the in the community. So like that's not really a bad thing, right? Like maybe it's not a first time West Her customer is how the program was designed, but ultimately, if we're rewarding a loyal customer for sending a buddy of theirs to a to a, one of our stores, we're okay paying it, and we pay out you know seven figures a year and just referral checks. Um, so, so I would say we care about repeat referral. We care about doing things the right way. We talked about this on the setup call or whatever, but Buffalo, New York. And so everybody's markets are different. I don't know what markets we're talking about here, but in Buffalo, it's a very tra uh, non-transient place. So there aren't people bouncing in and out like a Chicago or Miami or LA or New York city, perhaps people are born here. They grow up here. They work here. They stay here. Like there's a lot of that transient, you know, non-transient behavior. So, so if you treat people poorly and they have a negative customer experience at your store, they may never, you may never see them ever again, right? And that costs you a great deal of money. So we need to behave in a way that's proactive, tries to squelch negative word of mouth. We have a couple of different things we do internally to try to stay aware of when things might not be going the way we want them to. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, we look, we care, we care about customers coming back to us. Um, Scott, like a real simple imagery, Scott driving around a neighborhood, he would see one of the things that drives our growth. We have 30 stores, right? Why do we have so many stores is because he saw one Westhurst license plate frame in the driveway and he wanted to sell the other two and a half or whatever that are in the driveway. Right. So we started expanding the brands that we have over time. And now we have all the brands, basically. Um, and so we can fulfill that promise to a family. Right. You don't have to just buy a Ford, a Ford from us. You can buy a, a variety of things. First question coming in from the audience. Where's the best place to spend marketing dollars for a smaller independent dealership? So uh, I was just at NA, NIADA in Dallas, uh, Dallas, I think, or San Antonio is where I was. Uh, so independent counts. So I got a, a, a fun opportunity to talk to a lot of indie dealers, various sizes, a lot of buy here, pay here's and stuff. And, um, you know, learned about sort of cash flow management. We don't do any buy here, pay here stuff. But look, I would say very, I would say this across industries, not even just auto. If I had like a very limited budget to spend, I would spend it on Facebook. If I have 500, a thousand, maybe like if I have an advertising budget of less than 5,000 bucks a month, I would spend all of it on Facebook. And why do you why do you say that? Well, so based on my own uh, assessment of traffic that we're driving to Wester.com, uh, we sp and and we spend 10, 10 times more money on Google and paid search than we do on Facebook and Instagram and social advertising. But part of the reason that's true is because of co-op distortion. So this was an independent dealer question, I think. So they don't probably have a co-op consideration. So 80% of the paid search money I spend is all dri driven by co-op rules. So hundred percent reimbursement back from Ford and Subaru and, you know, whomever, right? Like all the brands. So in that sense, it's driven the cost up, the cost per acquisition for, for referral traffic or cost per lead on Google. It's about 10 times more expensive on Google, but it's harder to execute on social. There's a friction component. If you're an indie store, you have an awesome opportunity to like tell your story, humanize yourself, you know, be wild bill with your cowboy hat on, whatever, like do your thing, like whatever's authentic to you. If you wanna tell customer stories, uh, employee stories. Maybe you got an employee with a really weird, interesting hobby, you know, that like, maybe they're like a all-star photographer and you're in their air in your area. We'll dive into like that little niche because on Instagram, there's a bunch of photographers in your area that you could kind of connect to and celebrate and embrace, you know? So there's a lot of opportunity, I think. Um, it's not as simple as just spending money on social. I get that. Um, I think a lot of people, the mistake they make is like they spend some money on Facebook the leads maybe don't generate immediate return or enough sales immediately and say, ah, oh, these leads are shit. Our BDC, funny story, our BDC, we did a campaign where we generated, I think it was like 2000 Facebook leads. And our BDC got mad at our team because we didn't communicate we were going to generate all these extra leads. So that was a mistake we, we made. Um, but they felt like these customers uh, weren't good leads. And so when I, we talked about that, I said, well, why, why not? Why are they not a good lead? Well, because they, we, 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 they're not making an appointment for today or tomorrow, right? So they weren't low enough in the funnel for how the right. BDC wanted to act with that customer. That doesn't mean they're not a good customer. They just needed to be nurtured in a different way. So we need to talk to them about, oh, you're still looking, you're still browsing. Hey, how about check out these six cars? Don't worry about selling the appointment just yet, right? Just keep them moving along the, the, the train. They're a human being that wants to buy a car. So, so uh, yeah, so I would spend money on Facebook if I was a small dealer. Thank you. Next question. For a new dealership in the area, what's a good way to break into a market? Hmm. Um, I don't have any direct experience. Well, I shouldn't say that. We, we have seven stores in Rochester, New York. Um, the first two stores that started there in our journey uh, were a BMW and Mercedes store. They do not have the Western name on them, the BMW of Rochester, Mercedes-Benz of Rochester. We bought a Ford store, Western Ford of Rochester. That was our third Ford store in Western New York. The other two are in Buffalo and they're very big stores, very successful. Like we know how to sell Fords. We know, you know, we're great, right? West Her means something in the Ford world. Well, it turns out 60 miles away in Rochester, nobody gives a shit about the West Her brand. So that's 10 years in the making of us trying to establish ourselves in the Rochester market. Um, I would just say this, look, if you focus on your process in the store and you maximize each transaction, every time and you care about when things don't go right if you're patient and you give yourself time that will snowball 
it's not an instant quick fix. Marketing, I think, is sometimes looked to as like the magician of like, hey, make things things happen. You got to have the right people at the store. You got to have the right process. You can promise anything you want in the world, but if you don't execute against it at the dealership, you're just a charlatan or a snake oil salesman or something, and it's not gonna it's not gonna be fruitful for you. You're just gonna burn a bunch of money in advertising. So if you just care about the process, care about the customer, make sure the experience is great, ask for referrals, care about your reputation management, do some of the blocking and tackling, which don't cost money necessarily. Um, I think that's the better way to, to grow in a market. Next question. What's a good size marketing team for a store that's moving hundred cars a month? So you might not have a team. So uh, I think it's pretty common not to have dedicated marketing support uh, at a store size of a hundred or less. Um, you probably have a sav savvy sales manager that's like juggling a couple hats, maybe, right? Like a general sales manager or something. I was a sales manager juggling like the, hey, have you seen these car these car keys? And I'll ask the salesperson, did you did you did you look for them, <laughs> right? And they'll say no. And then you're juggling the phone, and you got a customer waiting for you in the showroom. It's challenging. Um, one of the great luxuries I would say of a group like West Her is we have enough scale to afford people like me that can think about nothing other than sort of this marketing discipline and the marketing experience. Um, that does matter, but I would say a, a store size of a hundred or less, you, you'd be lucky, I think, to have like one marketing specialist or marketing coordinator budgeted, I don't know the salaries in your area, but maybe like a 50, $60,000 a year type job. If you were going to make that first hire, what would you have that person do? So I think it's it, you have to be real clear about roles and responsibilities. Like, are they interacting with the BDC or not? Are they just managing vendors? So one of the things in automotive space, trade pending, right, vendor, um, we have to manage a lot of them. So I think the marketing role in automotive retail is often a relationship vendor management thing because you got a lot of people out there. Um, to, to sort of keep tabs on your website vendor or your CRM company, right? You got to kind of be caring about the reports or analytics. So depending on your skill set, um, you know, and, and then being resourceful. So we, we do use freelancers from time to time, but you can freelance a graphic designer or uh, a def developer if you had like an ambitious project you wanted to sort of create. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I would say, you know, somebody that's project management oriented. I do think having some sales experience helps marketers be better. Um, Cause it's not just like, it's real easy for marketers to be like, Hey, this was a great campaign. The sales team sucks. And it could be real easy for the sales team to say, Hey, we just need more leads. Cause we're great at what we're doing. Right. And there's a lot of finger pointing between the two camps. Um, I sold cars in the middle of winter in Buffalo, New York. I got a lot of empathy for our 380 salespeople that do that job every day, working with customers, getting told no a lot. Um, you got to have that like perspective to then guide sort of conversations moving forward. It gives you some credibility. Um, but I think what I see often is people just get hired as these marketing people. They have no experience at the dealership. Um, maybe they're savvy, maybe they're not, but they often just turn into like an order taker. So like the highest paid person's opinion, the general sales manager or the GM, or, you know, maybe it's a service manager or something is telling that person what to do. And they're just like, okay, uh, yeah, I I'll go do that. Wonderful. The last question is more of a comment. It says, Wes Her is awesome. Go Bills. Let's go. Let's go. Josh Allen's going to turn it around. So anybody that's got Josh Allen on the fantasy football direct, uh, you know, leagues, he didn't have a great start to the season, um, but don't worry. He's a, he's a beast. His stats will come up um, for sure. So, All right. We're going to move on here. Matt, thank you. Please stay. We, we might have some more questions here as we go. So Should I like block myself so you guys don't like look at me like picking my nose or like what do you want if, me to do? If you can restrain yourself from picking your nose or doing anything obscene, you can stick around. Got it. All okay. right. Hang there on. we go. All right. So we're going to wrap this up. We promised we'd look at, at 10 dealerships who are doing fantastic. And so we're going to, but we're going to speed through these rest pretty quickly. And we've really bucketed this into, we can think what to call it, like the value your trade, sell us your car, scorecard. Here it is. So we're looking at placements and then really who's making a, a good effort at proactive marketing. So we looked at Sheeler Motor Mile here. And so like, again, a lot of solid fundamentals in place but we have a, a little call out here for the button in the CTA stack here. So you can see our wobbly bird there pointing out that, yep, we can get the car pre-approved, see your value, and you click on this, 
we're expecting to see like, hey, walk somebody through a trade-in process. Instead, they're going through a 16-minute process, a digital re retailing process. It's not that one is better or worse than the other. Depends on what your strategy is. If you want people to go through that digital retailing process, use something like this. If you're looking to turn them quick and create an inventory sourcing opportunity to trade in lead, go more of the trade pending style approach. When we look at the Williams Auto Group here, Again, another just subtle difference here. So they're doing a lot of fundamentals, right? But something we notice here is that they're using a marketing message. These guys are a trade pending customer, but they're marketing to say like, hey, we'll give you $5,000 over Kelly Blue Book, right? So this is a strategy to say like, yeah, we almost know that those values are, are low or they're wrong. We're gonna give you a lot more. Um, we obviously come from a different school of thought. It's like, yep, here's the trade values. You, you guys, the dealers adjust them to fit and match your local market and strategy there but a good call out nonetheless. So McGrath here, when we look at all their fundamentals, they're really not doing too much in terms of placements, but what they are doing really well is some of their key messaging, they're running active campaigns across social media, and then we'll, we'll tie all this stuff together so you can see that it's not always necessarily a bad thing if you don't have all these fundamental placements, they're doing all these things. We're looking at the Larry H. Miller used car supermarket right here. And in this case, Again, they're not doing a lot of the fundamentals we typically recommend, but they are doing really, really strong messaging and actively promoting it. I love this, like we'll give you $4,000 for anything. I like got a lawnmower and a tugboat in there. Like I can't even imagine what's, what's coming through the CRM in those cases, but it's gotta be entertaining. And then these last few, we're just gonna lump together here because we wanna get out of so much of the tactical and bring it back up to the big picture. But the last tactical thing we'll call out here, we really like what Billion Auto is doing here with their call out. You can see it right here. They've got their own separate value your trade menu item right there. So kudos to you guys for that. But what's really impactful here is, you know, all placements aside, right? It comes back to this philosophy. It's not about what tools you have on your website. Obviously, some are better or serve different functions than others, but it's really about what you do with them. And that's that right column there, the campaigns, UTM tracking. So just being active, proactive and marketing what you have available, your inventory sourcing strategies, and to be able to track and report on it and to, to show that, yes, this one works better than that one. All right. If you've made it this far we will send you one of our wobbly birds in that little back box. Matt, do you have one of these? Um, I don't think so. All right. We got one coming to you. Love so yeah, that. go Love to this, bird. go to this URL bit.ly slash Pete bird. We'll send you our lovable mascot there. All right. That's it for the webinar. Let's take a look, see if we got any additional Q and a here. We got some chats in here. Trade pinning related, where do we find the most value in our trading tool on our website? Um, the stats are all over the place on that. If you are running a lot of campaigns, uh, it's going to be that custom landing page. Otherwise, it's typically spit, split fairly evenly across homepage, SRP, and VDP. But again, that can be market specific, geographic, geography specific. There's a lot up there. All right. I think there's a there's an interesting segue of like prioritizing yeah. of websites. I know you have a particular vantage point from trade pending's point of view. There is a, a philosophy debate there of like how many widgets, how many CTAs, how many fucking things that should be on a website. Um, and there's probably too many, right? And oh, like yeah. ultimately, we as dealerships have to decide and prioritize. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, maybe buying cars is a priority for you. Maybe you're not that good at it, and maybe. Uh, subprime credit leads, or you want to get prequal credit leads or something, some niche play, like maybe that's more important, but you can't do everything. I think the mistake is like you do all things to all people and then you're essentially nothing. So um, having some restraint and being intentional with your decisions, I think is really important because don't forget those landing pages. In that chat, we were talking about VDP and landing pages, at least for West Her, produce the most leads. Um, the, the landing page is because we send traffic directly to that page, right? From social, right? So, yeah. so th that's, so at, depending on how you want to go about it, you don't have to have it on every, everything. I know that's the best practices. I think that's the out of the box install with most vendors. Um, but you know, that, that'd be my take restraint is okay. That's true. And, you know, you mentioned this before the marketing person, a lot of times does vendor management, um, 
that's a thankless job there to try to take companies like us and everybody else that's coming to you and saying like, okay, yeah, this is important. That's not, this gets priority. That's not. So that's, that's no easy task there. And, and to your point, Matt, there, you can see here that uh, a lot of folks are making decisions like where they want to have the placements, right? It's, it's definitely dependent upon what you're looking to achieve. All right. We are a little bit over time here. So we're going to wrap right. things up. Matt, thank you so much. You got a wobbly bird coming and maybe some other surprises. I would just say this, if we didn't answer a question or if like, you know, whatever you didn't ask, you didn't care or whatever, if you want it, you, I'm totally open book. If you want to connect to me, you can on LinkedIn or wherever. And I'm happy to try to help you or give you an unbiased opinion. Um, as marketers, if there's a lot of marketers here, we got to stick together, I would say generally. Um, it's a it can be a lonely world in automotive. There's a lot of salespeople out there, uh, not as many marketers. So to the degree I can offer a perspective, I'm happy to do it. So thanks. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon.